Hi, everyone. Welcome to Live with the 19th, a virtual event series of conversations with women on the front lines of politics and public policy. My name is Emily Ramshaw, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of the 19th, a new nonprofit newsroom launching this summer at the intersection of gender, politics and policy. Uh, I am thrilled today to be introducing this conversation between the 19th Washington correspondent, Amanda Becker, and Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Uh, before we do, I just want to thank our sponsor of today's programming. Thanks again to Bumble, a connections app designed to help you make meaningful connections in love, life, and work. Download Bumble now to start making virtual connections in all aspects of your life. And I just want to quickly note uh, that while donors and sponsors do underwrite our events, they play no role in designing the line of questioning or suggesting the speakers. Uh, all right, well now before we begin, I would like to introduce my colleague, Amanda Becker, who's going to kick us off with a few housekeeping details. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you, Emily. Um, before we get started, just a couple quick housekeeping notes. First of all, we would love it if you share the 19th with your friends. You can ask questions during this conversation by tweeting using the hashtag the 19th live or by leaving a comment on our Facebook page. And please get notified about future events by visiting 19thnews.org forward slash subscribe. And you'll also receive our excellent newsletter. And now I'm thrilled to welcome uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer from Michigan. She's the 49th governor of Michigan. She previously served in the state house and Senate where she was the first uh, woman to lead the democratic caucus there. Uh, she delivered the democratic state of the union response and we are thrilled to have her here with us today for this conversation. Welcome governor. Thank you, I'm glad to be with you. Thanks. So first of all, uh, we'll kick things off with coronavirus. You know, one of the huge topics on everyone's minds right now. Um, you said last week your office put out some statistics that um, due to the aggressive steps you took early on during the pandemic, um, before that, Michiganders were transferring an average of the virus to an average of about three people, and that's gotten down to less than one person. So I was wondering what, um, in your own words, you called them aggressive steps early on, do you think really made the difference in kind of getting the pandemic under control in Michigan? So March 10th uh, was the day of the Michigan primary or the, in the race for president. And it also was the same day that we had our first two cases of COVID-19 test positive. I had already declared um, that, you know, once those cases showed, we would go into a state of emergency. And so we immediately did. I had already um, gotten our state emergency operations center up and running. And that was something that was really important as we have so much work that's happening across agencies. And we know how moving quickly was gonna be really important. I think what we did not anticipate, um, and I don't think anyone across the country anticipated, was how quickly the cases would grow once we started to detect it. Michigan had exponential growth in the very early days. Two weeks in, uh, we saw our numbers rising so fast that we had hospitals that were already at capacity. And it happened to be at the same time that New York and New Jersey and Connecticut were on that same trajectory. And so um, it was really important that, that we take aggressive steps. So I took kids out of school pretty quickly. I issued an executive order to close bars and make restaurants, uh, dine out only, carry out. And um, eventually we went into a stay home, stay safe order. And ours was really aggressive in that um, it precluded people from going out unless they had to um, do some sort of a life sustaining activity, like going to the grocery store or to the pharmacy. But we basically shut down just about everything else. And it was because of those actions, I think that Michiganers took it seriously and did their part and we, we flattened our curve. And I think lots of studies are showing now that we saved thousands of lives. We'll never know, but, you know, who among us uh, is here because of the actions that were taken. But there's no question, the trajectory that we were on and versus the actions that we took, we we flattened that curve. And I, I'm still, of course, concerned about a second wave as we see playing mm -hmm. out across our country. But those were some of the steps that we took. And you're in the midst of reopening, and your safe restart plan has both phases and goes by geographic areas of the state, if I understand it correctly when I was reading about it. So I think as of today, hair salons, um, nail spas, that sort of thing reopened in parts of the state as part of phase five. And I think I read that other parts of the state will get there by the 4th of July, kind of where are you in the reopening phases now in Michigan? 
Yeah, so Michigan is a huge state. And I know, you know, if you haven't been to Michigan, um, when you look at it on a map, you know, there's two peninsulas and um, it's a it's a massive state. Our experience with COVID-19 was the exponential growth was in Southeast Michigan. So the greater Detroit metropolitan area, Mm -hmm. certainly there were um, other experiences on the west side of the lower peninsula. But as you got north, um, there were fewer and fewer COVID-19 cases. And as we watched kind of hospitalizations and our testing capacity, it became clear that we had very different regional experiences with COVID-19. And so as we worked with our epidemiologists and some of the best minds in public health from the University of Michigan, as well as business leaders to to really um, focus on what the inherent risk is with different sectors of our economy, We did a geographic overlay as well. Um, It became very uh, clear to us that we were able to move certain sections of our state a little bit quicker into uh, phases of re-engagement. So the Upper Peninsula and the Northern part of the Lower Peninsula were two regions that moved um, earlier into phase five than the rest of the state. Haircuts start today and uh, I never would have imagined the kind of uh, public input that we'd have about haircuts, but Uh, As of today, everyone can get a haircut across Michigan if they schedule an appointment and observe these best practices. So they still got to wear masks. They're still going to be, you know, uh, we have to determine and make sure that there are fewer people in a shared space so that we Mm -hmm. can keep COVID-19 from spreading and lots of um, CDC guidelines around hygiene that we've promulgated at our own state level. So we still have to be very smart. COVID-19 is still here. Uh, We've done... a We've made incredible sacrifice and it's worked, but the fact of the matter is we can't let our guard down. And I think that's my biggest concern. But as we move toward these, this phase five, that's about as normal as life is gonna get until we have a vaccine. And so it's nice to be able to re-engage, but we just have to stay smart. And we actually got um, more than a couple viewer questions about this. So I thought I would do a couple of those right now. Okay. Um, Lori in Washington asked, is it true you prohibited people from going in their own yards? How did this help check virus spread? So no, it's not true that I prohibited, I did not prohibit people from going in their own yards. Early on, uh, when we had exponential growth, we uh, thought it was very important that even though people are home and they wanna do yard projects, that we close some of the nurseries because we didn't want people going out unnecessarily, not for a life sustaining activity. And while, uh, you know, we all want to, our yards to look lovely. It was important that we close that down so there's fewer people out and about. As we got into our first wave of re-engagement, that was some of the first stuff to come online. But people were always able to go outside. In fact, we encouraged it because we know that we are safer outside in the fresh mm-hmm. air so long as we maintain that six feet apart and, and all the best practices that we all have come to know are, are important in keeping COVID-19 from spreading. Um, another viewer question. So, you know, your stay at home order did um, poll pretty well. The majority of Michiganders supported it, but there was some backlash. And Victoria in Virginia wanted to know, knowing what you know now about COVID-19, what, if anything, would you have done differently in how you communicated with your constituents? So I, I think that's a great question. I'm not quite sure what the answer is to it in this moment. Uh, we have been working so hard, whether it is COVID-19, we've also had a 500 year flooding event where two dams failed and we had to evacuate 10,000 people in the midst of a global pandemic. On top of that, obviously we as a country are having an important conversation around policing and we are trying to make sure we keep people safe during that, um, you know, during demonstrations. And so uh, having the opportunity to really reflect on things that I might've done differently is not something I've had the luxury of, but I would say this, there's always room for improvement. We are all building the plane as we fly it. We're in the midst of a global pandemic. And frankly, governors across the country have had to step up and do things that um, there's no handbook for and we never imagined we'd have to. For one, but give me, let me give you one example. Early on, we were just struggling to get masks for our nurses mm-hmm. and doctors. Literally went into one of the first weekends with one shift work of PPE, masks and gloves and gowns. So one of the things I had to do early on was set up a global procurement office in our state emergency operations center. We were trying to buy masks from anywhere in the world we could find them. 
and they were getting delayed or sometimes they were getting redirected to the federal government. And it was a tough time. And I took to the airwaves and talked about it because we needed help. I don't regret any of those actions. But if I could go in a time machine and go back, I might have set up a global procurement office last fall and supplied the whole country with the things that states were competing against one another to get. Sorry, is that unusual? I mean, I'm not a governor, our viewers are not governors. Is having to create a global procurement office for something, um, is that normally something that's like within the wheelhouse of what the governor is doing? Or did this pandemic just really kind of force you to take on new roles and pursue new responsibilities? Well, generally, that should have been the role of the federal government. And I think that was part of the uh, frustration many of us have voiced in various interviews we've done. And that's not a partisan observation. It is simply a fact that the federal government is much better positioned to procure items for Americans across the country than having states bid against one another and try to outrace one another to get masks. The federal government could have deployed the Defense Production Act a lot earlier on and started to build up the national stockpile so that when we needed it, we had access to these things. So having 50 states competing against one another in a race where it drives prices up and makes it harder for you to actually get the things that we need um, was what we had to do because that wasn't happening on the federal government level. Mm -hmm. but. Generally speaking to your question, no, that's not something that you would anticipate having to set up in all 50 states. And yet that was the position that we were in. Um, and you gave a great preview of kind of where I want to go next in terms of policing and racial tension and also the floods. Um, so if we could start with kind of these protests that have been occurring nationwide and even globally the past couple of weeks over policing in America and race in America. Um, you chose to take part in at least one, I think, and you and you marched. Um, you know, this is after you've been telling people to stay at home. So there was some people saying, and now she's out marching. Um, could you talk about why it was important to you to participate in that march? Well, it was important to me for a couple of reasons. Number one, you know what? I think that this is a righteous cause. And anyone who saw the footage of what happened to George Floyd and isn't outraged, isn't paying attention. And frankly, so many people that I know who are in policing are outraged as well. We as a country need to do better. And this is a moment that we have seen people of different races, of different backgrounds, of different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, different you know religious backgrounds coming together to, to demand better. And I thought that it was important as the governor of Michigan for me to show my support for that. I participated in a diverse uh, ecumenical march. So we had rabbis and we had bishops and we had an imam that was there um, and walked with the mayor of Detroit and a number of activists and the lieutenant governor. My, my kids joined me as well. Um, they are 16 and 18 and are as um, in tuned as so many young people across our country are right now around this and they wanted to participate. And so I thought it was important because I believe in the righteousness of the cause. But second, I want people to see that you can, you can exercise your first amendment rights safely. Mm -hmm. And so we wore masks. We didn't always, we weren't always able to stay six feet apart, but i kept my mask on. We didn't high five or handshake or hug the way that I usually would greet people because I didn't want to um, spread or, or receive COVID-19. There's ample use of hand sanitizer. And so I think it's important for people to see you can support and you can demonstrate and you can do it in a way that keeps you and your family and your community safe. Thank you. Um, so moving on to you put out a, moving on to policing, you put out a couple of recommendations last week, I believe it was. And I'm going to read this so I get the name right. The Michigan Commission on Law Enforcement Standards. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what that commission is? I mean, policing is so dispersed in this country. It often occurs at the state, the county, the city level. Um, what is that commission and what does that request that you made mean to mean in kind of practical terms? Yeah, so this is a commission, we call it MCOLs, and they oversee all of the training for our police organizations in Michigan. There's a representation of a variety of police organizations uh, and the leadership of MCOLs. And what it is uh, that we are going to start doing is doing a better job in terms of training for de-escalation, uh, training on implicit bias, uh, and mental health screening. 
I think that um, that's not all inclusive and that won't completely address all of the issues that we're confronting as a nation. I think there are a lot of great um, suggestions in terms of ensuring that officers have a duty to intervene if they see one of their colleagues uh, unlawfully using force on, on a citizen. I think that these are, um, this is a good start for how we go about elevating and educating um, people that go into policing. If you are vested with a, a badge and a gun and you know, with the um, responsibility of keeping a community safe, you, we need to make sure that they are trained, that they are um, have the kind of screening and um, accountability that that we need in terms of people that have that incredible responsibility. Now, you mentioned the duty to intervene, um, and you have encouraged policies that are duty to intervene. I was wondering if you could explain that. You've also encouraged more efforts of reporting of for um, reporting statistics in terms of use of force. Um, what role does the governor's office play in that? I mean, are you you're encouraging them? Are there any steps you can take? Is that part of the SB 945, the policing bill that's in the state legislature? Um, and kind of what would be next steps in terms of the of those policies? Yeah, so, so that bill coming to my desk so I can sign it into law is important because I can set an expectation and I can communicate with the colonel of the state police who I appoint and who sits in my cabinet. But in terms of making it applicable to all of these different policing agencies, we need to have a law in the books. And so this bill, takes a big step toward that end. But if you're, um, you know, as we think about the other three officers that were, that were there while George Floyd was, was being killed, um, to impose on them an affirmative duty to intervene, I think is one additional step that we should be looking at and considering. And it would take a law to do that. I've got a legislature that, um, is, you know, Republican legislature, and we've worked well on some things. We've struggled on others. And that's not to be a surprise, but I think I'm hopeful that this is a space where I can get real legislation done here because a policy should transcend whoever is in the governor's office. And that's why getting it in the books of the statute, I think, is really important. Um, you mentioned the flooding earlier, too. So you really had a... a uh, quite the first 18 months in office here. First, the pandemic, historic flooding in the state, um, and then the protest. Could you tell us kind of what happened in the Midland area in May? Um, two dams um, deteriorated or were breached. 10,000 people were evacuated. Um, there are now two um, what used to be lakes that are now kind of just like silt beds. Um, what happened there? Um, you kind of infrastructure was one of the big things you ran on when you were running for governor. Um, what is the current situation in that area of the state? And, you know, if you could also just describe kind of what happened there to viewers. Yeah. So when I ran for governor uh, in the 2018 election, I um, ran on fixing the dam roads mm -hmm. and really it's fixing the dams and roads. It's about infrastructure. And in our nation, Michigan is not unique, although I would submit we've got some of the worst roads in the nation and uh, many different um, engineers and engineering groups have given us that unfortunate title. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we have consistently underinvested in infrastructure. We've got roads that are crumbling. We've got uh, dams that are old. We've got um, old water infrastructure underneath the ground. And so what I've been trying to do since taking my oath of office is get a budget passed that would give me the ability to invest in these things. But the fact of the matter is I have been very worried about a bridge collapsing or a dam failing. And that's what we had to happen in Midland. We also, in combination with old infrastructure across the state and across the nation, have had global warming where we've got more water, more precipitation, not a full free. We had a record 500 year uh, event happen uh, in combination with dams that are are old and haven't been kept up uh, that converged to create this terrible situation. It, it was devastating. And as you said, you know, a couple of lakes completely emptied out because the dam wasn't there to keep them intact and flooded a town. Um, and we had to evacuate 10,000 people in the midst of this global pandemic. So it's been devastating for the Midland community. And we have uh, initiated a lawsuit against the dam owner. It's a privately owned dam. 
It was over um, seen by the federal government up until just about a year and a half ago. We, under my predecessor, it became uh, the responsibility of one of the dams for the state. And so we've got an investigation that has begun because we want to get accountability and have transparency. So we know precisely all of the different factors that went into this devastating event. And that's something I didn't realize until I was actually reading about the flooding there that um, a lot, if not the majority of dams in this country are privately owned. So it's a private owner that operates those dams in Michigan. Um, what will this um, investigation look like and who is conducting it? So our Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, uh, that's where the experts that um, you know do this type of work are located in state government. They'll be working with some independent investigators as well, and they'll be uh, putting together a report. It's going to take a while. I mean, this is a dam that is old. This is a dam that's had um, a lot of different interactions with the federal government. The feds wash their hands of this owner and this particular dam. And so there are a lot of different um, pressure points here. Another is the local community had sued the dam owner and because of that the water had been raised. And so there are a lot of um, a lot of things that we want to make sure we get a full understanding of and and are able to ensure we get accountability for for what has absolutely been devastating to this community. Um, and now I'll, I'll move on to some more reader questions. And actually, one is related to water in a different context. So I'll start with that one. Um, TJ in Austin wanted to know, um, he wanted an update on the situation in Flint in terms mm. of clean water and whether that situation has been ameliorated and what is happening there in Flint. Yeah, so I appreciate the question. Though Sadly, the world knows about Flint. Uh, my predecessor made some decisions and we know that um, the people of Flint uh, paid a terrible price for government that was focused on saving a few pennies instead of protecting the public. And um, I have uh, been working incredibly hard with the new mayor to make sure that we've expedited replacement of the pipes and, and they're close to being done. Um, this is not something that I've had an update on the last couple of months because we've been so focused on the mm -hmm. pandemic, but I know that we've made um, incredible ground and that the water is lead free in Flint now, uh, but replacing all of the pipes I know has been an ongoing, incredibly um, enormous undertaking and they've made great progress in Flint. Great, um, Ben in Annapolis wanted to know, you have faced several crises in your short period as a governor, coronavirus, flooding, racial tension. Which one of these has taught you the best lesson about leadership that you didn't already know? Hmm. I, I think it's the convergence of them, to, to be mm -hmm. honest. Uh, I, when I was addressing the state, when I had to declare a state of emergency during the um, flooding event, I caught myself saying, you know, this is a once in a lifetime event. And I had said that so many times in the weeks preceding because of mm -hmm. course the pandemic is as well. Um, and I, I think that in the midst of all of this, I've been really fortunate uh, because we, have a great team in state government. I've also been able to build some wonderful relationships with my fellow governors, and I've found that to be incredibly helpful. No one can appreciate all of the different pressures that the nation's governors are under in navigating and trying to make decisions to save lives and ameliorate the impact on our individual economy but other governors get it. And so to be able to have um, those kinds of relationships where we can share our thought process, share our, you know, the intel intelligence that we're able to collect to um, navigate concerns that we have together, I think has been really important. And so um, those are just a couple of anecdotes from, from my time doing this. But I never would have imagined that in the midst of all of this, it would become so partisan. And I think that's an unfortunate aspect of the climate that we're in right now. Public health should not be partisan. And I have said many times, uh, this isn't a, we're not one another's enemies. The enemy is a virus. And we all, uh, we'd be in much stronger position to save lives if we could all remember that fact. Speaking of relationships and partisanship, um, you've had your various back and forth with President Donald Trump. Um, about coronavirus, uh, but then you kind of had a moment of 
more agreement or accord during the flooding when you when you reached out to the federal government then. Could you talk about kind of your relationship with the president and how that has evolved, if at all, over the past six months? Well, I, I've been very clear about where I think that there were shortcomings early on in the COVID-19 response. Um, not having the national strategy so that the nation's governors are piecing together and what we have is a patchwork of policy across the country. Um, not having a strategy around procurement of PPE and even today as we try to ramp up, we still don't have enough swabs and reagents so that we can do the robust testing that the CDC recommends we do. We still don't have enough of those supplies. And I think also um, it would have been better for the people of this country, whether they're Democratic or Republican or agnostic, to have accurate, consistent medical information coming out of the federal government. Um, and that would be echoed at the state level. But we didn't have those things. And I think because of it, it's really hurt us as a nation and it's hurt our people. And it's prolonged the amount of time that our economy will suffer because of COVID-19. And yet, um, when I spoke out, I know that it made the White House unhappy. Clearly, they, um, you know, made some tweets about me and some comments about me in press conferences. But here's the thing: lives are on the line, and it, there was a point in time where our numbers were so frightening and our ability to combat was so undermined that I was on the air trying to get any help I could for the people of Michigan. I'm never going to be bullied or tweeted about or protested into making a decision that I don't believe is the right decision for the safety of the people of the state. And whether they voted for me or against me or didn't vote at all when I was on the ballot, if they live in Michigan, it's my job to do everything I can to protect them. And I'm going to. Um, a couple more, we'll try and squeeze in before we're out of time. Um, I'll ask you both of these at once because they're both about voting. Um, Noah in Washington wanted to know um, about the 2018 redistricting commission that was created. It's a 13 member independent body. Um, the courts just upheld the legality of that. Um, what would your recommendation be to states that continue to use partisan approaches to redistricting? Um, and I guess we'll start there. And if we have time, I'll ask you one quick other one about voting. Well, so this will be Michigan's first opportunity to draw lines with a group that is outside of the legislature. And it's something that's been a long time in coming. I, as a former member of the legislature, know that legislators picking their constituents is the opposite of how it should be. It should be people picking their legislators. And so taking the drawing of districts away from legislators, I think is um, going to prove to be a, a great thing here in Michigan, but we haven't even lived through one cycle of it yet. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, but I, I do think across this nation, gerrymandering is a real problem. Um, and it's keeping people from getting opportunities, keeping people from having real representation in their legislatures. And I think that um, any state that hasn't taken away from the legislature should. And it's my, I think it's my understanding that that will all be done based on the 2020 census. So it won't be in place yet for this, this year. Right. Um, looking at this year, just to wrap things up, um, people had a lot of questions about voting and voting safety in November. Um, just first of all, voting during a pandemic, what steps are you taking to make that more, more safe for people in Michigan? And also um, Susan and Wilmette, I believe in Illinois asked, um, in 2016, some polling places were moved and changed in a way that could discourage black voter participation. Either they were put at police precincts or places that people might, might not feel as comfortable going. Um, what are you going to ensure safety overall in voting in November? And also some of these groups to uh, make sure there's no disproportionate impact on, on certain demographic groups. So we want people to vote at home. We wanna make it easier for people to vote at home. You're safer at home. And um, that is a way to ensure every person has the ability to sit down with their ballot. Now, clearly there are Americans with disabilities who will need to vote in person and will need a, a, an additional system. But for the vast majority of people, we should be voting from the the safety and comfort of our own home. Uh, this will be our first election where we really have that robust ability. We have a great Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson, who is working to ensure that that is the case. She's already sending applications out for absentee ballots. But up until uh, 2018, you couldn't do that unless you went in and signed an affidavit that you were out of town for the election. We've made it easier for people to vote at home, thankfully, in the midst of a 
global pandemic that's so important. So we had our first election in May. Um, we had twice as many people vote in a May election as you would have otherwise expected. 96% of them, I think, voted from home. Wow. And so it can be done. And I think when it is done, we're going to have an even greater turnout. So my hope is that states like Michigan, who weren't able to do that before, who are now really expand on that, whether it's a pandemic or not, voting from home is really uh, the way to move forward in this uh, democracy and make it easier for more people to participate. Thank you. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. I could ask you questions all day, but thank you so much again for joining us today. Um, we know you're obviously very busy, so we really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Um, and Emily will come back on in a minute, but before that, I wanted to tell you about our next event on July 9th with Kay Bailey Hutchison, Ambassador to NATO. And you can RSVP for that conversation by going to 19thnews.org forward slash events, RSVP and submit your questions for that conversation in advance. And now back to Emily. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you so much, Governor Whitmer. That was a terrific conversation. Uh, I also just want to thank Bumble again, our presenting sponsor of this event series. We are so grateful for your support. Um, I want to let you all know that the 19th is a member supported newsroom. We are launching this summer and would just be over the moon for your support in making the 19th a reality. You can sign up for emails about future events at 19thnews.org slash subscribe. You can also join our nonprofit newsroom by donating $19 today, 19th news.org slash join. And thank you all so much for joining us today for this event. And we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks for our event with Kay Bailey Hutchison.